this basically, I did change the title because actually this represents everything about the project and everything about the research we've been doing. Uh, this simple line from uh, a poem that we'll talk about. Um, and I'll just start, I'm going to start the talk, a little introduction to the project quickly, go very, very quickly, because I don't want to spend the whole time as a case study or to talk about my lovely community project, it's not the point. But the whole point is actually to talk about the breaking outside of the, the boundaries of straightforward conflict archaeology. Um, I haven't gone for national, I have actually got a national, because I did that as a slight panic, thinking it's not national. But it's the idea of breaking out of just that confines of one area of research into different things and how you can start spinning off and how one part of a project that you start off doing actually goes off into different ways. So let's go quickly through. This is a, a First World War centenary project from the Wiltshire Museum um, and the Wiltshire Archaeology Field Group and as part of it my colleague Tony Hack, uh, the Wiltshire Medieval Graffiti Survey. Um, three main things here. Uh, it was recording the graffiti, identifying the graffiti, and then asking the question, why? Why was it there? And I'll, uh, I'll show you what I mean. Um, Wiltshire is a, oh, we haven't got pointers or anything, it's a small, it's a county in the middle, you can see where the arrow is, and we're looking at this place here, Fildeen, is a very small, oh, I have one, thank you. Brilliant. Uh, Fildeen here, very, very small, tiny little uh, village, this whole area is the Salisbury um, training area that's still a, a modern day um, a Ministry of Defence training area, a modern training area. And these here are a number of the first World War camps that were around. So it's just to give a bit of concept, uh, context. Uh, 1916, um, over 100,000 Anzac troops and British troops were all training in this area before they went over to the front. So. This is a little map of the village, uh, part of it, and basically there are three places where the graffiti was found. One in the church, one in a, uh, a bank of trees at the top, actually carved into the tree, so sort of the uh, arbor glyph here. And then one in a small brick uh, building. So those are the three areas that we found graffiti. Um, and to give you an idea of the graffiti, this is the church, this is the back of the church, this is basically the graffiti found all the way up the passage, the stairwell, all the way up the back of the church, which is like a viewing platform looking down on the nave, all the way up into the bell tower, which is you actually accepted through, there's a door here, trap door, a little ladder, even on top of a, a wooden cupboard that housed all the, um, the bell pulls and everything like that. So the whole place was covered in graffiti. Um, you can just see sort of the idea, all, all this stuff here, 90% of it is First World War graffiti. Uh, there's another slide showing some of the examples of just this sort of multiple <laughs> mount of graffiti laid over, some of it laid over the top of each other, some of it higgle piggle the uh, pencil carved. Amazing that still so much of it is still survived 100 years later. Um, this is the, the little brick building. Um, and again, you can just see that the, this time the graffiti is carved uh, into the brick walls. There's only part of this building left. It was a lot, a lot bigger at the time. Uh, and these are a couple of examples of the trees. Um, you can see, I think, is it, is it New Zealand EF Expeditionary Force? And there's another one up there. There are some Canadian ones as well, and they're still there. Um, as I said, Part of it, the simple thing when we started, First World Sutuni Project, it's like, let's identify, can we identify some of the people? So a large bulk of the, the research was into that. And you can just see a couple of the examples of some of the pencil work, um, graffiti, giving dates, times, uh, units, addresses, nationality, things like that. Uh, some of it's inscribed. This was actually on the sort of the barrier looking down, or the rail looking down onto the nave. Um, so, in terms of quantity, it's that idea of, you know, over 400 graffiti in the church, 200 in the smithy, this is rough. Uh, First World War, majority is Anzac, majority is 1916, 17, uh, and lots of different information. Um, if I give some sort of context to other graffiti that's been found on different projects, there has been, it's nearly, nearly always associated with training areas, with trenches, um, but nothing in this sort of quantity. 
Um, so it's not unique, but it is unique in, in the county in terms of the actual sheer number and the quantity and its focus on two separate areas. And I'll uh, give you an idea of why. So this was it. The next thing was why. Um, we went through all the procedures, go through all the looks. Is it, was it the church associated with a, uh, a certain unit? Was it a, a certain area? No, nothing. It's very random. It's all different. And then it's, you start thinking, let's look at Google. And you start looking at some of the archives and then things start coming about. So the first clue was Anzac diary entries, recording, visiting, file dean, the village. Um, some of them, again, personal photographs, Anzac photographs of different things, different parts of the church and file dean, the school, uh, a smithy. You've got postcards. It starts bringing up, not ju just in the content of the coastlines, but also in the pictorial representations on them. Uh, and then we've got more postcards and even more postcards. And he's starting to get these sort of common denominator, this sort of thing, you know, hold on a minute, they're all saying the same thing. Why? What's going on? And it's all to do with a spreading chestnut tree. Um, and this is one of my favourite bits. Uh, this is a digitised diary uh, of one of the soldiers that's actually sort of pressed a leaf from a chestnut tree that came from the village, Fildeen, and it gives a very good clue. I think if anyone can read it, it says, this is from the, the, the tree. I can't read it here. Uh, the spot is claimed to be where Longfellow wrote his great poem, The Village Blacksmith. Fantastic, we've done it. We now know why all the graffiti is there. So Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, 19th century American poet. Uh, the Village Blacksmith was written in about sort of 1852-53. He's a famous poet. He wrote um, Hiawatha, other things like that. Um, fantastic. Right, we now know why. Everyone went there to go and see the place where he wrote and set his uh, poem. But the issue is actually very common and this thing, it's fake news, it was a lie. Um, so probably thousands of Anzac's troops went to visit this place. It became this huge tourist attraction, uh, but it was all based on a myth, or on a lie, on a... I don't know where you can do it... Uh, this is where you start looking at how these things develop, and this is where this research goes. Why? Who started the myth? Who started this? Was it done for a deliberate reason of extorting money? Was it an industry, or was it just pure chance, pure luck? So it starts this whole thing, and then that's where finish the recording project, that's the bit, but actually you're looking at a whole load more different uh, threads of investigation. And I wanted to have some sort of mad mind map sort of of strings of everything, but I couldn't, so I just found a, a little kitten. Sorry about that. But it gives an idea of just this unravelling of all the different types of investigations, everything that you can do. Um, and this is where it starts becoming this breaking out of the boundaries of just confined to this very simple project, centenary project, First World War, soldiers, trace them, find out what happened, talk to them, to actually start this whole area. And it, it really sort of like a, a snowball coming down a, a hill, it gathers and gathers and there's different questions and you can go quite mad. Um, so what I wanted to do is just quickly as part of this is look at some of this thing and I did put my, the global because I suddenly thought, oh, national borders. And I was trying to represent how this, this village is tiny. There's not even a pub in it, you know, there's a church and that's it. It's how this tiny, tiny little village that very few people even now go to became the centre of this sort of global, um, well, global army of people. So you've got your Anzacs are travelling to Fildeen through the, the medium of a poem that was written by an American that they all thought was based in a village, which they went, they went to the church, they wrote their names on it, they bought postcards, they then went to France and Belgium, some of them came back, some of them didn't. But when they did come back, they wrote in their diaries, because a lot of the information is coming back is from the, uh, the diaries and from the archives in New Zealand and Australia. There is nothing in England. We have very, very little information. In fact, we have nothing in any of the national archives or any of the local archives, or even the newspapers. I've got one newspaper article on this. So it's completely an Anza, a New Zealand and an Australian 
phenomena, even to, to the point where it got into the New Zealand Times. So it's that sort of whole area. So, and I've tried to just think about it. But what I was going to have a look is, is just try to have some of the ideas, some of the ways you can start researching, some of the different aspects. So I put this together as the project's in the middle and you've got these different aspects. So you've got, you know, participative tourism, you've got the heritage protection outcome, a little bit of uh, historic England sort of context to that. You've got that direct tracing it, you've got memorialization, you've got making your mark the whole meaning of graffiti, why was it made? You've got this whole souvenirs and postcards and physical mementos. And then you've got the whole, this whole huge, huge area of the role of the poem in uh, late, uh, late 19th century, early 20th century society, culture, education in Australia and New Zealand. These are massive, massive big topics that we've not even started looking at and probably won't all of them because these are for other things. But it's the idea that there is so much more that can be looked at that it breaks out. So what I'm going to do is just go through a, a, a couple of these. And, and a colleague of mine, Katie Whitaker, helped me with this. I'm hoping it's going to work. So I'm going to go. Let's have a look at... Which one do we want to do first? Uh, first World Tourism. Um, when we started, finding is tiny. And you start looking at stuff. And suddenly, we started finding loads and loads of references to Stonehenge and pictures and drawings. And it's this... Basically, a lot of these streets will go over and they write about it. They have these things. They go, oh, we went to, uh, went to Stonehenge and it's a few old stones. And then we went to Fildeen and saw the smithy. And so you've got the village and the smithy in the same line as Stonehenge, which is, you know, a UNESCO World site, Heritage Site. It's incredibly important. But it's all really interesting because actually these soldiers are going there. They're buying books and, and uh, talking about it. And then they're coming back and thinking, actually, what am I can I do and everything like that. So it's different. Um, Fildeen here, you can see on this one here, is part of the church. It's part of Cape Town. It's on the same thing. It's actually sort of, you know, it becomes part of a, a memory of these people. It's the idea of this, uh, the attraction of old, ye old villages. These are a lot of these are first century, uh, first generation New Zealand and Australians. So they're going back and looking back at where they were. Um, then you start thinking, how did this, this whole tourist industry, was it, how was it created? This is the one article, 1915, this first postcard made by Fuller, a local Amesbury photographer, predates the Australians coming. So it's actually created a postcard before they came. So the postcard that originally was there, was there set. So what, you know, how did that get established? So it's this whole other questions. Who created the attraction? How well organized was it? Was it actually a tourist attraction? Was it sort of created as an industry? Um, and then you've even got the broader ones on looking at First World War tourism or the uh, respite and, um, rest and respite recreation of troops on Salisbury Plain. Mil how was it sanctioned? Was it military sanctioned? So I'll go back and I'll have another look at the another one, souvenirs. So souvenirs, postcards, physical mementos, the diaries talk about Snicking bits out of this chestnut tree, taking bits of bark, taking leaves from the tree, even stealing thread from the bell pull and fabric from the church and from the roof. So they're taking physical mementos with them. Um, postcards. We've got 11 different postcards of this place and probably thousands and thousands of postcards being published and printed. And again, these are interesting because they're portable. They're, again, they're taking them away as mementos. Um, Further research in the whole industry of postcards is, is really interesting. But then the last thing I'll just think here is, is this, this dichotomy between graffiti and the portable souvenirs. So you're taking things, take with you, and then you're leaving things behind. You're leaving your mark. So there's a whole area to explore the psychology of that. There are lots of people who research postcards, do research stuff like this, so it's tapping into that and trying to broaden it. So I'll leave it. Then, in the moment.